but we do want to bring in someone who knows Donald Trump very well, his former attorney, Jim Trusty. Jim, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Sure. So Emily Finn was just talking about this, the former president maintaining that this trial just should not happen and, and that his attorneys did not have enough time as well to review uh, materials from prosecutors. The judge has already denied so many delay requests. In your mind, is there anything that will stop jury selection for, from starting tomorrow as planned? Yeah, I think it's highly unlikely. I mean, the problem is each time you come to a judge with another explanation for why you need a delay, it becomes less and less likely you're going to get it and more transparent that you're seeking delay for the sake of delay. I think their best hope was when they had this document dump a couple of weeks ago to pull out specific examples from those documents and say, look, we need to investigate this. This is exculpatory information that they just dropped on us. Absent that, and again, we haven't seen it yet, so I'm not expecting it tomorrow. But absent that, I don't think there's any real likelihood of derailing this thing that starts tomorrow. And, and Jim, I thought this was really interesting. You said that you believe people will lie or shade things to get on the jury. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, jury selection has become very hard in this country in even routine cases. But particularly for these high profile matters, we have this phenomena of celebrity jurors. You know, they go, they deliberate in private. They're told to stay quarantined and to stay true to their oath about deliberating, and then they're on TV the next night talking about everything that happened. It's a real temptation for a lot of folks. And I think it, with a person like Donald Trump in the center, there's going to be such strong opinions and, and such knowledge by prospective jurors that if they just answer things a little bit this way, that they have a chance of getting on the jury. And, and I, I think that's mischief. I think that's a bad thing really for either side in a high profile trial, but I think it's likely that you'll have some sleepers, some people that get on this jury with a mission long before they hear any evidence. You know, we're, we are getting a look at this jury questionnaire as well. I want to bring this up. Uh, there are questions on there, including about whether jurors belong to groups like the Proud Boys or Antifa. What is the reasoning for asking these specific questions? Do you believe that these are fair questions? Yeah, I think they're fair questions. I mean, normally when you have a questionnaire, it's much more common in the context of a death penalty case where you've got strong opinions about the death penalty either way that might allow the court to eliminate people quicker. And that's really what you're talking about. It's a painful process of picking a jury when there's either something like a death penalty as an issue or a high profile defendant. So here what they're doing is using the questionnaire to try to weed out the easy ones, the ones where the juror is clearly substantially impaired, maybe by their own admission, they don't think they'd be able to be a fair juror for one side or the other. So questionnaires are helpful in terms of weeding out that type of problem, as well as scheduling issues to see which people the parties might even agree on to eliminate before you spend days or actually weeks in this case, probably picking a jury. And you also point out that DA Alvin Bragg originally walked away from this case. You say that this is creative prosecution and that that is never a good thing in a high profile case. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, there's a commonality between all the cases that President Trump is, is facing, which is some creative lawyering. And I think when we're talking about something as historic as going after a former president or, or you can view him as the number one presidential opposition of the current administration, either way, you know, we should have predictability. We should have transparency. We should have an attorney general that doesn't get ahead of himself trying to come up with a creative way to try or uh, to, to impugn this president. So, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for the appellate process probably in New York, maybe on the jury level too, when they look at how they're using federal law, for instance, as a hook to avoid the statute of limitations. Remember, non-disclosure agreements are not illegal. If they were illegal, we wouldn't have a Congress. I mean, there's a whole fund for non-disclosure agreements there. So that's not the issue. It's really a bookkeeping violation and it's a creative one saying, well, they lied to their own books and therefore, that somehow couples up with federal election law to be a felony in New York. I, you know, I don't think I think it's a stretch and we'll see if the judge treats it like a stretch, which I think is unlikely. But, you know, a jury locking in on the credibility of Michael Cohen in a creative prosecution gives President Trump some hope that he could actually come out of this thing unscathed. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.